the restoration of Exum Priory had been a stupendous task. For little had remained of the deserted pile but a shell-like ruin. But because it had been the seat of my ancestors, I let no expense deter me. The place had not been inhabited since the reign of James I, when a tragedy of intensely hideous, though largely unexplained nature, occurred. It appeared that my ancestor was accused, with much reason, of having killed all the other members of his household in their sleep. This deliberate slaughter, which included his father, as well as three brothers and two sisters, was strangely condoned by the villagers and slackly treated by the law. With this sole heir, nevertheless legally denounced as a murderer, the estate had reverted to the crown. The accused man, making no attempt to exculpate himself or regain his property. Shaken by some horror, greater than that of conscience or the law, and expressing only a frantic wish to exclude the ancient edifice from his sight and memory, Walter de la Power fled to the United States, where, by the end of several generations, the family had achieved a proud and honorable, if somewhat reserved and unsocial, Virginia line. After the Civil War, the family moved north, I emerged and grew to manhood, to middle age, and to ultimate wealth within the grayness of a Massachusetts business life. And my wife, Emily, died shortly after the birth of our only son, Alfred. And Alfred, in the Aviation Corps in 1917, they both had died, leaving me old, bereaved, and aimless, a retired manufacturer. I traveled, eventually to England, eventually to Anchester, eventually to the ancient family seat, Exum Priory itself. The jumble of tottering medieval ruins covered with lichen, perched perilously upon a precipice, denuded of floors and other interior features save the stone walls and the separate towers. The priory had been allotted to the estate of the Norris family by the crown. And now, three centuries later, I purchased the ruin for a surprisingly reasonable figure and resolved to divert my remaining years by restoring restoring my ancestral home. I had secured the interest, assistance, and the friendship of Captain Nari, whose knowledge of the place had been increased through the years by his having accompanied the many architects and antiquarians who loved to examine the strange relic. The uh, mind your foot on that big stone yeah. over there. Mm -hmm. The um, the architecture you see is peculiarly composite. Uh, Gothic towers mm. resting over there yeah. on Saxon or Romanesque substructure. The uh, foundation is of a still earlier order, blend of orders, I suppose, Roman yeah. or even Druidic or native Cymric, if legends speak truly. And merged on the one side you see down here with the yeah. solid limestone of the precipice. Amiable Captain Norris. The place and its ancestry had an almost consuming fascination for him. He knew every detail of its history and its former structure, and became of inestimable help in the reconstruction. The uh, priory itself actually stands on the site of a prehistoric temple. Yes. A druidical or anti-druidical thing, which must have been contemporary of mm, Stonehenge and dates like that. Well, it's unfortunate that our neighbors aren't all antiquarians such as you, Captain Norris. I had not been in Anchester a day before I knew I came from an accursed house. Oh, yes, the country folk around here have their own sense of tradition, I'm afraid. 
They hated the Priory hundreds of years ago when your ancestors lived here. And they hate it now, with the moss and mould of abandonment on it. We'll have to go outside of the immediate vicinity for our workers. You see, it isn't so much hatred as the, the almost unbelievable fear they have of the place. And the scope appears to include both the Priory and, I'm afraid, its ancient family. Yes, I, I don't seem to be able to convince the villagers how little I know of my heritage. Oh, but to them, a lineage is beyond a message of knowing... It's in the bone and blood itself. Yeah. I'm not sure I disagree. But what do we see? After three centuries, a power has returned to his ancient site to reconstruct the very house. And for the villagers, you've come to restore a symbol abhorrent to them. Oh. Rational or not, you know, they view Exum Priory as nothing less than a haunt of fiends and <laughs> werewolves. Captain Norris. <laughs> Superstition. Well. Superstition, ghosts and ghosts. Oh, no, not quite that. No, ah, no. you share their worries, nevertheless. Well, so would you, Pyre. Yes. It's not a matter of the present. And it's not all superstition. Yes. This is an ancient place, Pyre. That indescribable rites had been celebrated here, no one doubts. Rites of the Sibylli worship. The Romans are introduced. Yes. Inscriptions yes. still visible in the subcellar of the Priory bear the unmistakable letters and signs of Magna Mata, whose dark worship was once vainly forbidden to Roman citizens. Mm. About a thousand AD, the place is mentioned as being a substantial stone priory housing a strange and powerful monastic order and surrounded by extensive gardens. You will see them right over there. Oh, yes. Mm. yes. Now, mind that uh, stone there. Yes. You know, the people didn't need any walls to keep them out. They were too frightened of the place altogether. Mm. It was never destroyed by the Danes, oddly enough. Mm. After the Norman conquest, it must have declined tremendously. There was no impediment when Henry III granted the site to your ancestor, Gilbert de la Poa, he was called then. Yes. First Baron Exon in, I think, 12... Yes, 1261. Yes, well, then it's the location, the house, not the family that inherits the bad name. Well, they became aligned, you see. Mm. And not... So far as we know, unwillingly. True, before their occupation, the family bore no evil report. But something strange must soon have occurred. You know, in one chronicle, there's a reference to Adela Poa as cursed of God. It's a strange phrase. Village legendary had nothing but evil and frantic fear to tell of the castle. The fireside tales were of the most grisly description. All the... Mind your head, darling. Yes. All the ghastly are because of their frightened reticence and cloudy evasiveness. And I'm afraid they represented your ancestors as a race of hereditary <laughs> demons. <laughs> well, what precisely happened, Norris? What went on? Well, there are these vaguer tales. Hackneyed spectral law, perhaps. Mm. Wails and the usual howlings heard around the place. Graveyard stench after the spring rains. The servant girl who'd gone mad at what she saw in the full light of day in the priory. <laughs> the accounts of vanished peasants are less to be dismissed, though not especially significant in view of medieval custom. Prying curiosity meant death, and yes. more than one severed head had been publicly shown on the bastions around Exon Priory. Ah, yes, yes. Well, <laughs> it's difficult. A few of the tales were exceedingly picturesque. For instance, the belief that a legend of bat-winged devils kept witches' sabbath each night at the Priory, a legend <laughs> whose sustenance must explain the disproportionate abundance of coarse vegetables harvested <laughs> in the gardens. <laughs> but most, most vivid of all, there was the dramatic epic of the rats. The rats? Yes, the scampering uh. army of obscene vermin which had burst forth from the castle a couple of months after the tragedy that doomed the place to desertion hmm, three centuries ago now. You know, a lean, filthy, ravenous army which had swept all before it and devoured fowl, cats, dogs, hogs, sheep, and, you know, even two villagers before its fury was spent. <laughs> yes, around that unforgettable rodent army, a cycle of myths revolved scattered among the village homes and brought curses and horrors in its train. Yeah, yes, and that was just three months after Walter de la Parra had murdered his family and fled to Virginia. Yeah, yes, I should say about that. You know, one thing puzzles me about that murder. Walter de la Parra must have known for years the sinister tales about his family, so that this material could have given him no fresh impulse. I can scarcely conjecture what discovery could have prompted an act so terrible. What had he witnessed? Or stumbled upon. Oh, uh, take this parcel down here. Yes. yes. The, um, well, the general 
whispered sentiment seems to have been that he purged the land of a memorial curse. Such was the law that assailed me as I began, with an elderly obstinacy, the work of restoring my ancestral home. While living with Captain Norrie's family during the restoration of the Priory, I collected many such tales of superstition or fact. But it must not be imagined that they formed my principal psychological environment. I was constantly praised and encouraged by Captain Norrie and the antiquarians who surrounded and aided me. When the task was done, over two years after its commencement, I viewed the great rooms with pride. Wainscotted walls, vaulted ceiling, mullioned windows, broad staircase. All there, all as it had been, every attribute of the Middle Ages was cunningly reproduced. The new parts blended perfectly with the original stone walls and foundations. The seat of my father's was complete. And I looked forward to redeeming at last the local fame of the life, which ended with me. The interior of the old house was, in truth, wholly new and free from old vermin and old ghosts. The first incident occurred six days after I moved into the Priory. That night, dispensing as usual with a valet, I retired to the West Tower chamber, which I had chosen as my own. The room was circular, very high, and without wainscoting, the stones being hung with tapestry. I did not draw the curtains, but gazed out at the narrow north window, which I faced from the canopied four-poster. At some time, I must have fallen quietly asleep but I recall a distinct sense of leaving strange dreams. As I awoke, I found myself looking intensely at a point on the wall a point to which my eye had nothing to mark it, but toward which all my attention was directed. Whether the tapestry actually moved, I cannot say. I think it did very slightly. But what I can swear to is that behind it, I heard a low, distinct scurrying, as of mice or rats. Then it was gone. Some sort of effective echo, perhaps, coming from some other area of the house. There was no need of my looking behind the arras, for the walls were of solid stone, several feet thick. It was a while before I could drift back to sleep, and I seemed directly to re-enter my earlier dream, except that this time the vision was clearly horribly before me. I, I seemed to be looking... Down, down from an immense height upon a, a twilight grotto, knee deep with filth, where a white bearded demon, a swine herd, drove about with a sort of fungus beasts, whose appearance filled me with unutterable loathing. Then, as the swine herd paused and nodded over his task, a mighty swarm of rats rained down on the stinking abyss and fell to devouring beasts and man alike. But suddenly I was awake, wide awake. On every side of the chamber, the walls were alive with nauseous sound. The verminous slithering of ravenous, gigantic rats. I could see a hideous shaking all over the tapestry. But the motion disappeared almost at once, and the sound with it. I sprang out of bed and tore aside the arras to see what lay beneath it. Nothing. 
nothing but the patched stone wall. I, I stepped out of the room and stood for a moment at the head of the great ancient stairway, listening. Listening to the house. I could hear them. I could hear them faintly at first, but coming from all the walls. And as I descended, the stampeding continued with such force and distinctness that I could finally assign to their motions a definite direction. These creatures, in numbers apparently inexhaustible, were engaged in one stupendous migration from inconceivable heights to some depth inconceivably below. Rats? When I questioned the servants, they said they heard nothing. I didn't want to alarm them by insisting. No, I wasn't dreaming, Norris. It was no dream. But there have been no rats at the Priory for 300 years. Even the field mice couldn't be found in these high walls. Wherever would they be found in walls of solid stone? Mm. You say they were headed downward. Hmm? Captain Norris helped me explore the subcellar, but absolutely nothing untoward was found. We could not, however, repress a thrill at the knowledge that this vault was built by Roman hands. You see up here, it's not the debased Romanesque of the bungling Saxons, but the severe and harmonious classicism of the age of the Caesars. Look here at these inscriptions. T. M. Temp. Dona, Lucius Thricius, Pontificatus. What is it? Attis. Yes. Hmm. Attis. The reference made me shiver. But I had read Catullus and knew something of the hideous rites of the Eastern God, whose worship was so mixed with that of Sibili. Look, hold your uh, lantern up here. No, not, not that yes. one. That's by the stone block here. Oh, yes, I see. Yes, you see the design cut into it, a sort mm. of rayed sun? Mm. That's not Roman. No, that's not Roman at all. It's of an earlier origin. These, these altars had merely been adopted by the Roman priests from some older, perhaps, Aboriginal temple on the same site. Come down here. Let's have a look down here. Norris and I determined to pass the night in the crypt, and couches were brought down by the servants. We retired with the lantern still burning to await whatever might occur. The vault was very deep in the foundations of the priory, and that it had been the goal of the scuffling and unexplainable wrath, I could not doubt. But why? Why? As we lay there expectantly, I found my vigil occasionally mixed with half-formed dreams. I saw the twilight grotto and the swineherd. The fungus beast wallowing in silk. They seemed nearer, nearer and more distinct. I, I could almost observe their features. Beasts, but not exactly beasts. They became more distinct as I watched, looking up at me. Terrifying. Terrifying. Norris, uh, 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 uh. Norris, wake up, Norris. Wake up, wake up. What's it, fellas? What, what's wrong? Did you hear? Did you hear them? Did you hear them, Norris? What, what? The rats. Rats? I, I heard I heard nothing, nothing at all. Still downward. They were they were going still farther oh, down. No, no. There were cellars below us, Norris. Cellars? Norris, was it hallucination? Was it madness? Why have they stopped? Why have they stopped? Why why is it silent now? Hmm. Perhaps you've been shown what certain forces wish to show you. They were headed downward. In this altar. See, Norris. The lantern. The lantern flickers at the crevice here between the altar and the floor. There must be some kind of by Joe. There must be some way of descending, some door, some some kind of entrance. Balanced by some sort of counterweight, I expect. You see, look here, look. The entire stone pivots aside. By Joe. There's your cellar power. Uh, uh. Uh-huh. Stone steps descended into an abysmal dark, but scrawled across them as far as we could see. Skeletons, skeletons, attitudes of panic fear all over them. Oh. The marks of rodent noise, of ghastly 
they are ready. I think you oh. and Orson Semi. Semi-apedom. We oh, descended oh. the hellishly littered steps. Mm, horrifying, but extraordinary. Look here. Out through solid rock. Notice the strokes here. Look, according to the direction of this passage must have been chiseled from beneath, upward. Oh. No, look at that. You notice the air? There's a cool movement of air. Probably some fissure in the cliffs above. Yes, look for a power, the stairway ends here. There's light filtering down from somewhere up here. I can't quite see it, but... Harry, it must be morning outside, you know, almost enough light to see. It's a sort of grotto. Enormous! You, you can just barely... The descent from reality had almost prepared me for what was to come. Norris when I reached him, stared out with a look resembling that of the skull at his feet. Then I followed his eyes over the subterranean world before us. Dear God. We uh, must not uh, underestimate the uh, archaeological importance of such a discovery as this. Huh? The twilight grotto was of enormous height and stretched farther than any eye could see. There were buildings and other architectural remains. In the center, a circle of monoliths, but dwarfed, everything dwarfed by the spectacle on the ground. An insane tangle of bones, human or nearly so. Like a foamy sea, they stretched pastures of demonic frenzy, either fighting off the menace or clutching other forms with cannibal intent. Yes, the skulls suggest a rather baffling mixture. Mostly lower in the scale of evolution than Pithic Anthropus, but in every case definitely human. Actually, some of them seem to be supremely and sensitively developed types. Horror. Horror upon horror. All the bones gnawed. Altars serving as butcher shop and kitchen. Mostly by rats. Uh, Cauldron. Dining table. Not all by rats, my jackal. Goblets brown stained and dry. Upon Notice the stone pens over here, for the keeping of herd, I expect, and out of which they must have broken in their last delirium of hunger or rat fear. Herds of some primordial human type. Oh, fascinating. And there are a row of cells, nearly rusted through. The tenants still locked inside. And on the bony forefinger of one, a steel ring with my own coat of arms. Hmm. Strange ideographic carvings here on some of the skulls. Here, look at here. Look at this power. You know, I believe they're Phrygian in origin. Cases of formally arranged bones with parallel inscriptions in Greek and Latin. Still downward, I could hear them. Where else, where else could they draw me? Across the grotto. Carrion pits of sword bones, picked bones, open skulls, <laughs> nightmare chasms, unhallowed centuries grinning their unnameable fancies. Then, then to the edge of a depth hideously foreshadowed by my dreams. Mm. An apparently boundless depth. Power, there's no end to it. A great mouth lined with human debris, spewing, swallowing, yawning out from the prime audio. Power, power, stay out of it. Stay out of it, man. The rat, questing new horrors, determined to lead me on. I ran, ran, following them. I heard voices, echoes, but above all that insidious scurrying. I felt them all around me. I was one of them, part of the ravenous army that feasts on the living and the dead. Well, why shouldn't rats see the Dilla Power? As a Dilla Power eat forbidden things? No, 
No, no, I am not that demon in the twilight grotto. It's not Nari's body I tear apart. It's not blood I keep upon and flesh. You faint and fear at what my family do. Blood, I'll stick it. I'll learn you how to cross. What is this wine can be this wine? Magna Mata! Magna Mata! Ati! Amazandoga! Ati! 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 That is what they said. I said when they found me in the blackness over the half-eaten body of Captain Nari. Now they have blown up Exum Priory and shut me into this barroom mat Hardwell. With fearful whispers about my heredity and experience. When I speak of poor Nari, they accuse me of a hideous thing. But they must know that I did not do it. I did not do it. They must know it was the rat. It was the rat. You scampering will never let me sleep. The demon rat. That raced behind the padding of this room and beckoned me down to greater horrors than I have ever known. The rat. The rat. They can never hear. The rat. The rat in the wall. That was The Rat in the Wall by H.P. Lovecraft. The part of Captain Norris was played by Bernard Mays, and Powers was played by your host of the Black Mass, Eric Bowersfeld. The technical production was by John Whiting. And now, good night. <laughs>